Take your Bible this evening, if you would, to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, please. Just two verses we want to read together this evening, Matthew 18, let's read verses 21 and 22, Matthew 18 and verses 21 and 22. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, and we'll read these two verses in unison tonight. Let's begin on verse 21. Ready? Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of these scriptures here tonight. And Lord, thank you for the good music we've enjoyed together this evening. Father, we're thankful for uh, people who sing from their heart and make melody unto the Lord. And it's a joy to sing the songs of God. It's, it's helped us tonight. It's ministered to us. It's encouraged us. It's good to be in church with the people of God. And Lord, I pray your blessing on the special now as it's sung and as uh, we begin to quiet our hearts and ask you to speak to us. Give us ears to hear what the still small voice of the Spirit of God would say to each of us this evening. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Lost in the darkness, I stumbled alone, far from the sunlight of day. Then Jesus found me and made me his own. He drove my darkness away before I loved him. He loved me before I found him. He found me before I sought him. He sought for me. Yes, Jesus, he cares for me. Chilled in the shadows, I wandered in sin. Far from the warmth of the light Then Jesus found me and changed me within Kindled his love in the night Before I loved him, he loved me Before I found him he found me before I sought him. He sought for me. Yes, Jesus cares for me. Now in the sunlight I follow his word through every trial and test. He is my Savior and he is my Lord. Gladly I'll give him my best. Before I loved him, he loved me. Before I found him, he found me. Before I sought him, he sought for me. Yes, Jesus, he cares for me. Amen, Mom. Amen. Our Father, we bow before you in prayer now as we come to the preaching of your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, that before we ever loved you, you loved us. We love you because you first loved us. And Lord, we're thankful for loving us and sending your only begotten Son to die on the cross as a payment for our sin. That we might be forgiven 
of our sin and cleansed from all unrighteousness. Now, Father, I pray that you'll help us as we open up your word together this evening. I pray, Lord, that you would <clears throat> quiet everyone's heart, that you'll help us to think clearly and to focus and concentrate for the next few minutes that we have to look into your word about this important subject of forgiveness. One that you took time to explain and teach to your disciples. And one that is taught over and over again throughout the epistles. It must, must be that you knew we'd struggle with this. And so help us tonight. And Lord, help us to be forgiving. Help us to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. And Lord, I'll thank you now in advance what I think you'll do in each one of our hearts and lives tonight. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> many of the battles that are fought, many of the fights that take place, many of the disagreements and troubles in a relationship, oftentimes many of the causes are the cause of a uh, divorce, cause of a severing of a friendship, all boils down to one thing, unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. If you have unforgiveness, it shows itself in wrath. Anger, bitterness, rebellion, depression, discouragement. And at the root of all those things, often, is unforgiveness. In Matthew, 20, or Matthew 18 here, the Lord is teaching His disciples about forgiveness. And as He teaches them, I think He teaches us. You know, Peter asked the question, how often does somebody have to sin against me and I forgive them? Seven times? Now, I think Peter had in mind, and, and, and you'll find out a little bit as we talk about these next disciples on Wednesday evening, this was an unlikely group of twelve to put together. These uh, men who were associated with being zealots were ones that were uh, part of a group that was going to overthrow the Romans and uh, kill if they have to. And they really wanted Jesus to be the king. That was okay for them to, to have that. And yet, you remember, part of the disciples, so you have the zealots and then you also have guys like Matthew who is a tax collector for the Romans. They, you, you think naturally these two would have been at odds with each other would have hated each other. We know that there was some competition between John and Peter. We know there was some, always a strife going on among the disciples about who would be the greatest. Or who's going to sit the one on the right hand and one on the left hand. <laughs> they were always kind of thinking about that. And so Peter here has in mind, the Pharisees even said, you only had to forgive somebody three times and then you can... Go after it. So he's, he's doubled it up plus one, thinking he's being pretty good if I go to seven. And of course, the Lord Jesus says, not till seven times, but until 70 times seven. And, and don't, don't, don't misinterpret that and think that, okay, I just have to keep a few more marks to 490 and then I can let him have it. I don't think that's what the Lord had in mind. I believe that he is saying we ought always be willing to forgive and we have a great misunderstanding of what forgiveness is. When you say forgive somebody, it, it means so many different things to people. A largely based on what we were brought up with. For some, it's, it's uh, your, your recollection of forgiveness is when you had a fight with somebody, your parents would put you and your brother or you and your sister together and say, okay, now you tell them you're sorry. Okay, now you say you're sorry. And you'd get something like, sorry. Sorry. Okay, that's good. Now hug each other. Okay, and then it's all good. That's not forgiveness. That's not forgiveness. 
That's not forgiveness. Don't teach your children to do that, please. Forgiveness is not just saying, I'm sorry, or I apologize. But forgiveness, as the Lord Jesus teaches us here, is an essential part of being a follower of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it's more than just relinquishing judgment to God. Oh, I've forgiven him. I just left that to God. I can't wait to see what God's going to do to him. Or what God's going to do to her. That's not forgiveness either. It's not just accepting the hurt and letting it pass. Oh well. Everybody gets hurt. I got hurt. It's okay. That's not forgiveness. True forgiveness occurs or happens when the cold emotions of unforgiveness are changed to warm and loving and compassionate emotions resulting from a heartfelt transformation. That means, listen, forgiveness is not just an act, it's a process. Forgiveness is not just an act, it's a process. <clears throat> it's compared sometimes to the canceling of a debt. <clears throat> forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. It takes two people to reconcile. It only takes one to forgive. Notice what Peter said. How oft, verse 21, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? What's missing here? Did he say anything at all about the brother asking him to forgive him? Nothing is said. How often does my brother sin against me and I forgive him? No mention of him asking me to forgive him. Though, in another part, when Peter asks this question, he says, if he comes to me, remember he said, if he turns again seven times in one day, Jesus said, you forgive him. But it's not based necessarily on someone asking. It only takes one to forgive. Let me give you several statements here this evening, all right, that may help us get a grasp of this forgiveness in our mind, okay? Number one, what the Lord teaches here is if I do not forgive others, God will not forgive me. Look in Matthew 18 with me, will you? Here's what Jesus told them. Verse 23, Therefore the kingdom is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. That's, that's probably the equivalent of nearly $100 million today. All right? I doubt... Anybody in this room could handle that. Okay? <clears throat> then he said, But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw it was done, they were very sorry <coughs> Excuse me. He came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had, had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their 
trespasses. The first man owed the king 10,000 talents, which we said is somewhere in our economy. Around $100 million would not be out of the, out of the realm of possibility. And the guy asked for patience and he'll pay it all. Now how many of you, if, if you ask somebody for patience, he would need more than one lifetime to pay back $100 million? Anybody there? <laughs> It'll never happen. Talk about patience. That's kind of silly. Kind of absurd to think that someone would wait like that and wait that long. See, 10,000 at that time in the first century was the highest number they knew. Yet the king shows mercy and he forgives him of the enormous debt. And by the way, it's a great picture of our sin against God. It's tremendous. It's huge. It's something we could never pay. And so God, the, the king here forgives him. And let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you owed that huge of a debt to somebody and he said, don't worry about it, it's canceled. All forgiven. Wow. You ever, how many of you ever had a debt and you paid it off? Huh? I mean, you had a monthly payment you had to pay and finally you made the last one. How'd you feel? Wow. <laughs> Feels good, doesn't it? Say, man, that's great to have that done. Think about if it was a huge debt and they called you up and say, you don't have to pay it, it's done. Paid in full. You'd be on cloud nine. You'd think this is the greatest thing in all the world. And yet this guy goes out in verse 28 and he finds one of his fellow servants, one of his buddies who owed him a hundred pence. A pence is about one day's wage, so he, made, he owed him about a hundred days wages. And he strangles him, takes him by the neck and wants him to pay. And when he wouldn't, he put him into the debtor's prison. So he's, he's showing that he's been forgiven, but he's unwilling to pass that forgiveness on to somebody else who owes him a far less debt than what he owed the king. In the model prayer that the Lord taught, He said, you pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God, forgive my debts as I forgive my debtors. That's why the Lord said, if you do not from your hearts forgive somebody else, God will withhold forgiveness from you. So we find out that if I don't forgive others, God will not forgive me. Now, ask yourself the question then, why, why was it so difficult for this guy? Uh, uh, let's not say this guy. Why is it so difficult for us? to forgive other people. We would all say, hey, I'm forgiven by God. I know that He's forgiven my sin. I know that God's granted me great forgiveness. But why is it we have people that we're unwilling to forgive? I think the second statement is this. Because we have to see ourselves as a 10,000 talent sinner. And oftentimes we don't. We see ourselves as I'm not as bad as they are. I mean, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, all of us have sinned, sure, Pastor. But I'm not like those guys at the prison. I'm not the I'm not like those are you people. I mean, that's not me. And we categorize our sin. We have levels of sin. But in God's eyes, it's all sin. 
God doesn't categorize it. God doesn't have levels. We, we go into the prison, and I know we're on, we're on the side where they say it's just level one or level two. Now we're going to maybe go into where it's level three and level four. They categorize how, how hard the crime is or how aggravated. He said the key word where you're going there is aggravated. You know, they have aggravated robbery or aggravated assault or aggravated whatever. So they categorize it, but God doesn't do that. And a lot of times we, we look at, and it's so easy to see other people's sin as big, and our sin is no big deal. I'm okay. Yeah, I know, I do a little bit of that, and I do it, but you know what, it's all right. That's nothing big. No, it's big. Sin is sin. You know, in fact, while I'm thinking about it, go to, go to the last book of the Bible. Come right back. We'll come right back to Matthew 18, but go back to the book of Revelation. Revelation 21. Revelation 21. A verse that sometimes you can use when you're witnessing to talk about the second death or talk about the lake of fire or hell. Notice Revelation 21 and verse 8. Notice the Bible says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable, those are people who would do extremely things against God that God would be say would be extremely hateful to Him. Abominable. Murderers. Whoremongers sorcerers, idolaters. Hey, that's a pretty tough list, isn't it? There's some threes and fours in there, don't you think? But what does he end with? And all? How many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? Everybody's, everybody's on Urban Meyer because he lied at a press conference. Bunch of stinking hypocrites. Like they never told a lie. You ever been in a situation and in a spot and on the spur of the minute you yielded to something and you said something that wasn't true? What do you do when that happens? You come back and say, you know what? I lied. I didn't tell the truth. But why are we shocked when a man lies? Anybody in here has never told a lie? I'll wait. Oh, I see. Bunch of liars. Huh? Yeah, and you're listening to one. Okay? Don't amen that. You see, but, but you understand the, the difference? Here's the whoremongers, the murderers, the idolaters, the sorcerers, and the liars. God's saying, it doesn't matter. There is no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's all black. It's all sin. It's all wrong in the sight of God. But, but we always don't look at ourselves that way. We categorize sin. We sometimes can so easily forget our great sin against God and yet so easily remember someone's sin against us. But God's forgiveness of my sin and God's forgiveness of your sin ought to be so great and so huge and so expansive that it will not only cover my forgiveness, but it will cover me being able to forgive others. It's that great. It's that big. It's that huge. Don't let what others have done to you become bigger than what Christ has done for you. In fact, extending true forgiveness to others is very clear and persuasive evidence that God has forgiven you.
So we don't always see ourselves as a 10,000 talent sinner. Number three, statement number three. It's not just the sin that matters, but the status of the one sinned against. We're all that $100 million sinner. But you understand who we've sinned against? God. <clears throat> Be ye holy, for I am holy. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Only when we begin to understand the hugeness and the magnitude of our sin against God will we be able to forgive others of offenses toward us. And God gives us unlimited forgiveness of our sin. Aren't you, aren't you glad that God has no limit? Now, Sometimes people have say, well, I know God's forgiven me. I've confessed it to God. I've asked Him to forgive me. I know the Bible says God's forgiven me, but I just can't forgive myself. Can you really forgive yourself? Did you know that's really a humanistic philosophy? Not a Bible philosophy. Not a Bible principle. You cannot forgive yourself unless you are the one that you sinned against. And your sin was not against you, it was against God. When, <clears throat> when Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife, he said, I couldn't do that and sin against God. He didn't say sin against Potiphar's wife, sin against Potiphar. I won't do it because I'd be sinning against God. David in Psalm 51 said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. It's impossible for you to forgive yourself unless you are the object against whom you've sinned. Let me illustrate. If you owed a great debt to somebody, month after month, you've made the payment. You struggled at times to get the payment made, but you made the payment. But one day you're overcome with frustration and overwhelmed with continuing to pay, both financially and emotionally. So you just decide one day, I'm forgiving myself of the debt I owe. You think that'll work? No. You'll find out quickly your forgiveness of yourself doesn't mean anything. Because your debt isn't against you. It's against the creditor. And only the creditor can forgive your debt. Do you understand? I can't, I can't owe Brother Bob money and Bob comes to me and says, uh, we had an agreement, you pay 100 bucks a month, Pastor, I didn't get your payment this month. I said, oh, Bob, I forgave myself of that debt. <laughs> Try that with your next car payment. See how that works. No, you can't forgive yourself because you're not the one you owe. Who do you owe? God. When I say i got to forgive myself, I'm taking God out of the picture. I understand someone who doesn't believe in God, someone who's not a Christian, saying, well, you've got to forgive yourself because God's not in the equation. So their sin is just against themselves or against somebody else that has nothing to do with God. But it's not so for a believer. It's funny, when we have verses about not being conformed to the world, and boy, if we talk about drinking or smoking or chewing or anything like that, everybody, yeah, that's right. But when we talk about conforming to the world in something like this, in philosophies, and being careful we don't, we don't get caught up in saying statements like the world believes, 
then we don't want to accept that. David sinned against God. Joseph said, I won't sin against God. Now your sin may bring harm to others, but your sin is against God. Your sin may harm yourself, but your sin is against God. How do you forgive yourself for a sin you've committed against God? Only God can forgive you. He's the one you sinned against. If you say, oh, i got to forgive myself, then you're taking God out of the picture and it's just you're becoming God. That you sinned against yourself. And God's not even included. So you have a choice. You see... If the creditor, listen, if the creditor calls you and says, hey, we're canceling your debt. You don't have to send us any more money. Your account has been marked paid in full. Now you probably would say, I'd like that in writing. Okay? But that's a good thing. And you get the letter and it says, or an email and it says, okay, it's paid in full. Print this out for your records. Do you really think you'd keep making the payment every month? Certainly not. You would not continue to be and live under the bondage of debt trying to pay the payment. You would accept the forgiveness that the creditor has given you and you would go on with your life not concerning yourself with that debt again. Well, why can't you do that when God has canceled your debt of sin? Why can't you do that when God has forgiven your sin against Him? Boy, it's real quiet, Bob. Real quiet, isn't it? See, God paid for your sin. By the way, when Jesus died on the cross, we say it all the time when we witness, when Jesus died on the cross for your sins, how many of your sins did He die for? And now let me ask you a question. How many sins had you committed when Jesus died on the cross? Yeah, you weren't even born. So He forgave all your sins that were yet future. So your sins that you haven't committed yet, there's forgiveness there too. It's already been paid for. You just need to accept God's forgiveness for those. Agree with God about your sins. And then live in His forgiveness. Live in the fact that Christ, through His blood, has canceled the debt of my sin. And I'm living in the forgiveness of my creditor, which in this case is God. If I tell somebody they have to forgive themselves, then I'm ignoring God. I'm taking God out of the equation. I want to walk... In God's forgiveness. Not in mine. Mine doesn't mean anything. I can't stand before God. Listen, people all across America this morning went to church and, and did rituals or did ceremonies or did whatever they wanted to do what thinking that they're taking care of their sins before God. Friday uh, at Madison, Friday morning, had a fellow sitting in the back and we were passing out the bulletins and he, I went to hand him a bulletin, Brother Danny, he says, oh, I'm not staying, I'm Catholic. I said, well, you're welcome to be here too. He said that, he had his Bible open and I said, that Bible there is what we use. He said, it doesn't matter what you call yourself, we go by the Bible. Well, we believe that when you take the bread and the, and the wine that you're literally taking the body and the blood of Jesus. And there were people by the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, that did that today. Thinking that's taken away their sins. Thinking that they've canceled the debt. What do you think is going to happen when they stand before God and God looks to see if they accepted His payment for their sin? Whether they accepted His forgiveness of their sin. They say, but God, I canceled out my sin. I forgave myself when I took communion. I forgave myself when I got baptized. No, we know that that's not right. We know that won't work. You've got to accept God's forgiveness. Then why is it after we're saved, we still think that, well, God forgives me, but I've got to forgive me too. 
I want to live in God's forgiveness. And, and, and enjoy His forgiveness of me because He's the one I've sinned against. Live in the freedom of His forgiveness. If I do not forgive others, God will not forgive me. I have to see myself as a 10,000 talent sinner. It's not just the sin, but the status of the one sinned against. I'm sinning against God. Not me. Let me give you statement number four. Forgiveness is always costly. Forgiveness is always costly. Now there are several aspects to forgiveness. Let me give them to you quickly. The first one is repentance. This is on the part of the one who has sinned. Now, repentance is sorrow, but it's more than sorrow. It's not only sorrow. Sometimes people are sorry, but they're sorry because they were caught. Not sorry because they did something wrong. Not sorry because they know this is a sin against God. Okay? And so, why do you think God would have us to say, forgive me instead of just, I'm sorry? When you tell somebody, I'm sorry, what are they supposed to say? Oh, that's okay. Oh, don't worry about it. No big deal. Or they don't say anything. But when you say, I was wrong, please forgive me. Now they have to answer. And they can say, yes. Or they can say, no. And that's why we don't want to say that. Because we're afraid they're going to say no. So we like to just say, I'm sorry. Because when, I, when we ask for forgiveness, it exposes us to being humble. The potential of being rejected. And I don't like that. So it's a lot easier on my pride if I just slip by saying sorry. Then I can get by. That's why God never says in the Bible, just come to Him and say sorry. In fact, 1 John 1, 1.9, when He says, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, that confession there is a word that means we agree with God about our sin. I have to say the same thing about my sin as God does. I have to agree with Him, and when I agree with God about my sin, then He is faithful and just to forgive me my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. As long as I think it's not that bad. I mean, I don't think it's so terrible that I do this or I do that. And, and again, then I'm leaning to my own understanding. I'm not agreeing with God. That's why, that's why the first verse we talk about in RU, that the very first verse the RU folks have to memorize, and probably that will be the first verse every Christian memorizes, but it, Isaiah 55, 7 says, let the, let the wicked man forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Are you willing to forsake the way you've been going, and, and forsake the way you think? I can't tell you, because the first thought they get when they come in, and, and they have some addiction, whether it's drugs or anything else, and they sit in that room and they watch this and they look at this curriculum and they look at the Bible verses and they hear the testimonies and they think, what in the world is memorizing Bible Scripture is going to have to do with my recovery? Are you willing to forsake your way and forsake your thoughts and agree with God that only the truth makes free and the truth is Jesus Christ? You see, if, you're not, if you don't get it right there, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it. But that's the way it is with forgiveness as well. Say the same thing about your sin as God does. The second thing involved is in forgiveness. The first thing was repentance. The second thing is mercy. And that's from the one who's been, whom you have offended or sinned against. And of course, you have mercy from God. And mercy, mercy is not receiving what we deserve. 
That's mercy. Grace is receiving what we do not deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we really deserve. God is both gracious and merciful. In mercy, He releases the offender from the punishment of sin. That's what the king had on the one who owed him the hundred million. He had mercy on him. And he let him go. He could have put him in prison just like the ex guy did to his buddy. Into the debtor's prison. Then there's a third part of forgiveness, and this is important. I want you to get this. It's called absorption. Absorption. A B S O R P T I O N. What it means is you're absorbing the cost of that sin. You're making a decision whether the pain is going to stop with you or whether you'll pass it on to others. That's why I say most people who are quickly angry, we look at them and say they got a hot temper. Are they short with people? Are they easily uh, get angry or upset? You, you can usually put your finger on the fact somewhere they have not forgiven somebody. Unforgiveness. They got hurt. Somebody did something that hurt them and they have not forgiven it. They haven't absorbed the pain. They're passing it on to other people. And it's normal to do. That's why most people do it. When someone's out to hurt people and they just mean and they do things that just hurt people, one of the best things you can do is sometime you get them aside and just look them eyeball to eyeball and say, who hurt you? Who hurt you? I'll guarantee you there's a hurt in their past that they've never forgiven. They've never absorbed it. Isn't that what Jesus did with our sin? He took our sins and our sorrows and He put them on Himself. And though He was in great pain and great agony as God punished our sin in Jesus, Jesus never lashed back. He, the pain stopped with Him. Even the accusers, while He's on the cross in agony, and the bones are out of joint. The nails are through His flesh. The crown of thorns crushed on His head. And they're mocking Him. He looks down and says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Never one time, even when the soldiers were beating Him and, and blindfolding Him and smashing Him with their fists and saying, Who hit you? He never lashed out. Never said, I can't take it anymore. Oh, there were 12 legions of angels standing by. That's all He had to do was say the word. But when He was reviled, He reviled not again. When He was threatened, He threatened not. And it would have been easy to do so because He was in tremendous pain. We go through some pain, some physical pain, and we lash out at people and we say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just in a lot of pain. Really? You want to tell Jesus about that? Absorb the hurt. Absorb the pain. Don't pass it on to other people. If you hold on to it, if you hold on to the unforgiveness, the Bible talks about in Hebrews, it becomes a root of bitterness. And it will defile others. You'll become poisonous to every relationship you get into. And it'll poison others. So, Pastor, how do I know if I've forgiven somebody if I haven't forgiven somebody? Well, here's how you can know. Here's some indications. You don't want to be in the same room as them. 
when their name is mentioned, you cringe. You hear something about them that maybe has hurt them or made their lives uncomfortable, and you're kind of happy about it. You're not sad. In fact, you feel pretty good. You feel like they maybe got a little bit of what they deserved. And one of the chief marks that you can tell whether you've forgiven or not is when their name is brought up or you talk about them. You tell the story all over again. You keep telling them how they hurt you. And why do we do that? Well, we're passing it on. We want to pass the pain on to someone else. And the truth is, we do that because we want that person to dislike them like we do. Hmm. Then there's something else. There's a fourth aspect of forgiveness, and that's something that's called justification. Oh, we're, we're justified by God. That's being declared righteous in the sight of God because of Jesus Christ. When God justifies us, when God declares us righteous, then He treats us just as if we had never sinned. Just as if we'd never done it. That's an amazing thing. You say, why is that important? Because God said... We're to forgive one another even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. We're to forgive even as God forgives us. That means we have to include this thing called justification. Hebrews chapter 8. Would you look there, please? Hebrews chapter 8. I'm glad I have a Bible. Hebrews chapter 8. And then we'll look at another verse in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 8. Notice in verse number 12, the Bible says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 10 and verse 17. Hebrews 10 and verse 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Interesting. Interesting. Two verses that say almost the same thing and almost identical. Did God forget He just said that two chapters earlier? <laughs> no, when God repeats Himself, it's always for emphasis. Now, God does not say He forgets it. How can God forget anything? But God did say, I will not remember it. That's a conscious choice, a decision that I choose not to remember that offense anymore. Aren't you glad God does that? God does that with our sins. He just said He did. So you may, and don't raise your hands, but I imagine all of us could raise our hand if I ask you how many of you have committed the same sin more than one time. We could probably all put our hands up. But you go to God. If you've asked forgiveness, you go to God and say, well, that's me again, Lord, I did it again. You know, honestly, God says, did what again? Well, you know. No, I don't. Well, and you name the sin, and he goes, I didn't know you did that before. He's chosen not to remember it. Aren't you glad? That's, that's justification. And he treats us just like as if we'd never sinned. He makes that conscious choice. That's why, are you listening? If someone's in your ear bringing up your past sins that you have asked God to forgive you for, it isn't God. It's the accuser of the brethren. And it doesn't say he's the false accuser. He's the accuser. He'll bring up the past. He'll bring up the failures. He'll bring up things that you've asked God to forgive that God says, I've chosen not to remember them anymore. 
But old smutty face remembers it. And the way you answer him is the way Jesus answered him. You answer him with the Word of God. And you give him the Scripture that it's the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, that cleanses me from all sin. And I'm walking in the light of God's forgiveness of my sin. And you don't listen to the accuser. But then we have to choose not to remember when someone sins against us. That's why this old thing of, well, I'll forgive, but I can't forget. Then you're not forgiving like God forgives you. And can anybody here, can anybody here afford to say, I don't need God's forgiveness, so I'll harbor unforgiveness to others? Not a day goes by that we don't need His forgiveness in some way. And so we have to be willing to absorb the pain, forgive, realize forgiveness is costly. God forgave us, but what did it cost Him? His only begotten Son and blood being shed on the cross. Don't you think forgiveness will cost us anything? If He bore that kind of pain for my sin, I can't bear the pain of anybody else's. Number five, the fifth statement is this, we only absorb the cost by the grace of God. So I just can't do that. You're right. You've got to have God's help. In fact, you can't live the Christian life without God's help. You're not only saved by grace, we live by grace. God's sufficiency to meet my need, that's His grace. It's only by His grace, by His sufficiency, by His enablement, that I can live the way He wants me to live. And I can forgive like He wants me to forgive. How did, how did Christ take on flesh? Live on this earth. Go to the cross and pay the price for sin and endure the pain. Absorb our sin and release us from the punishment. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet He became poor. You see, He... he he did that. He was able to do that by the grace of God. That's the only way we can do it. By the grace of God. Somebody says, I just can't do that. Too bad God won't help you. Too bad He'll give grace to others, won't give His grace to you. No, He certainly will. You've got to ask Him. And He will give you His grace. Statement number six, and I only have 68 statements, but no, I don't. This is the last one, I promise. And this is what I hope you remember. Forgiven sinners forgive sin. Forgiveness was originated by God the Father, demonstrated by God the Son, and commanded by the Holy Scriptures. Remember what I said earlier, to forgive others, we have to see how great and grievous our sin is to God. It's just, you just have to, you have to ask God to help you see your sin the way He sees it. I've told you before, we have, uh, there'll be elections coming up in a few months. You know, Congress always has a dismal approval rating. I don't know, I haven't heard anything recently. Talking about the, not, not the, it's the Ohio Congress, though that may not be great either, but um, the, the, the House and the Senate and all that, it's usually down around 10% or less. You know, drain the swamp, throw the bums out. And yet, 95% of the ones who are in get reelected. How does that happen? You know how it happens? 
People say, they're a bunch of scumbags. Man, they're voting this and they're spending money and they're doing that. Kick them out. And then when it comes time to vote, they say, well, no, my guy's okay. My, my representative, he's all right. And everybody all over the country says the same thing. It's everybody else that's bad, but my guy, he's, he's a good guy. Because we don't, People yell and scream about their public school and how liberal the schools are and how their teachings, and, and they are. And they got an agenda. And then, and then they say, well, what about, uh, what are you going to do with your school? Oh, no, my, my school's good. My school's okay. It's just, it's just in that nature and in our own human nature, we think ours is never so bad. And we have to be aware of that when it comes to our sin. And don't rationalize it. And don't, don't, don't smooth it over. And say, God, get alone with God and say, God, let me see my sin as you see my sin. Let me see what it is in your sight. So I can be able to forgive others. Because when you practice forgiveness, it transforms life. Let's easily and readily be willing to forgive. Because we've been forgiven a far greater debt than what anyone could ever do to us. Forgiveness. Someone said, we're most like beasts when we kill. We're most like men when we judge. But we're most like God when we forgive. Let's pray together. Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, God, for your great forgiveness that you have for us. Thank you for being willing to pay the price of forgiveness, the cost of your precious Son. Thank you for absorbing the pain of our sin. Thank you, Jesus, for taking our sins and our sorrows and making them your very own. For bearing the load and the pain to Calvary and suffering and dying alone. Thank you for forgiving us of that hundred million dollar debt. We could have never paid it. Father, help us to extend forgiveness to others who in no way ever could approach the sin that we've committed against you. Help us to forgive even as our Heavenly Father has forgiven us. Heal some people tonight from anger, wrath, bitterness by allowing them by your grace to forgive and to walk in your forgiveness.